Sane Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 11. Secrecy in Occult Fraternities The very word occult means hidden, and occult science has always lived up to its name. Rumor, no doubt, has had free reign, but experience has worn the cowl. Even in times and countries where the facts of occultism have been accepted and the mysteries respected, the cowl has not been thrown back, and the adept has secluded himself from veneration as sedulously as from persecution. To this day, the same venerable oaths are required on admittance to any of the numerous secret fraternities that abound among us, and although many, or even most of them, have nothing more recondite to reveal than an eccentric way of shaking hands and information long since available for the subscribers of lending libraries, others do indeed hold secrets that are of value. The reason for this secrecy is frequently and not unreasonably questioned. Do not other scientists give their discoveries to the world for the benefit of humanity? Why, then, should occult scientists conceal knowledge which is admittedly of inestimable value for human upliftment when it is being so earnestly sought after, to keep in private hands knowledge which should be broadcast for the benefit of humanity is to stand confessed as a charlatan who would make profit out of the infirmities of his brethren or retain power in his own hands for self-aggrandizement. It must be conceded that this charge could be made good against certain of the mystery schools at certain periods of their history, but in that we are not concerned. Our task is to investigate the charge that is brought at the present day by the seekers after initiation and see whether their claim can be made good or if the reserve of the Illuminati may be justified. An institution, like an individual, can never hope wholly to escape from the influence of its past. The experiences and vicissitudes it has undergone have made it what it is, and it takes time for other experiences to undo the work. The true occult orders date back to time immemorial when they carried on their work and developed their systems under conditions very different to those that prevail at the present day. Firstly, they had to carry on their work in the midst of a populace much less highly evolved than that by which they are surrounded at present, in an age when persecution meant something much more tangible than hard words. Some knowledge of occultism, or at least a sincere belief in its powers, was current among those outside the temple, and nothing would have pleased the rulers better than to make these secret fraternities a weapon of political power. Time and again they succeeded in their aim, and each time it meant the corruption and downfall of the mysteries so prostituted. It is little to be wondered that the oft-learnt lesson of misunderstanding, persecution, and exploitation at last sank in, and the occult fraternities became, as they have remained to this day, cryptic orders in both senses of the word. Times, however, have changed, and the guardians of the ancient wisdom may not unreasonably be asked to reconsider their position and say how much, if any, of the knowledge in their trust may be safely rendered available for the generality of mankind. The amount of teaching which is given must always be determined by the capacity of the recipient, and the occult fraternities can never give out to the world more than the world can take, and as the pace of the convoy is always that of the slowest ship, it follows that the amount of knowledge released from the mysteries must be determined by the capacity of the least evolved among its possible hearers. Fifty years ago, the experiment was tried of giving out the theory of occultism to the general public, and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was the messenger employed for this purpose. She taught the basic principles of occult cosmogony and philosophy, and these ideas have worked like leaven through the thought of the age and profoundly modified its standpoint. The bitter accusations she levels at the science and theology of her day would not be applicable to ours, so well has her mission fulfilled its purpose. She did not, however, teach the modus operandus of such simple miracles as she performed, and it is the custom of the Theosophical Society at the present day to procure its teacups through the ordinary channels. That section of the knowledge of the Magi, which is popularly called magic, was, as always, withheld. Most students of occult science have no doubt realized that it is concerned with the mind side of things, the mind of man, the mind of nature, and the unorganized raw material of mind, and they know that, theoretically, 
It is possible to manipulate all this by means of the powers of the human mind alone. Many schools teach their students that there is no other means of advancement than through the trained human mind. Some students, however, have realized that to try to control the mind side of things by the unaided mind is like trying to carry on any form of labor with the bare hands. Man is a tool-using animal, and the occultist is no exception to the rule, and it is the knowledge of the occult tools which is so sedulously guarded by the Illuminati. Just as the operative mason uses tackle and mechanical devices to enable him to handle weights beyond the power of his unaided sinews, so does the occultist in his rituals and words of power use the psychic equivalent of the lever, counterpoise, and pulley. The formulae of occultism exactly resemble the formulae of mathematics in that they are expeditious ways of achieving certain known ends that have been explored in the past and are too well known to need to be rediscovered by each successive student. Though, if the teacher be wise, he will satisfy himself that his pupil is capable of doing the necessary calculations and thoroughly understands the principle involved before he furnishes him with the mantram, or word of power, that is a mechanical device on the inner planes. When a true occult order confers the secrets of its degrees, it is really giving its initiates an ephemeris and table of logarithms, corresponding to the plane with which the degree is concerned. Madame Blavatsky, when she published The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled, gave to the world just as much knowledge of the secret wisdom as a student might obtain from a book of astrology if he had access to neither ephemeris or logarithms. It is quite true that he might observe the heavens and work out his own tables and compute his own calculations of the movements of the heavenly bodies, but he would need to be a mathematical genius to do so, and it would be a weary waste of time, for the knowledge is already in the world. So with occultism, the principles are available in the literature of many in esoteric society. Enough is given out to enable the student to see the implications of the concepts of occult science, but by no manner of means is enough given out to enable him to do anything beyond the exercise of a little mild and unreliable psychism, heavily adulterated with the workings of the imagination, which he possesses no means of counter-checking. We may take it, then, that the principles of occultism have been given out to the world under mandate from the Elder Brethren by such writers as Helena Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, Eliphas Levy, Pappas, Westcott, Mathers, and others of similar standing and scholarship, who have the right to rank as initiates of the secret wisdom, but that the modus operandi is still sedulously guarded, and not every initiator who invokes the name of God is called of our Father. The knowledge that confers the practical powers of occultism must remain, as ever, under lock and key, and this safeguarding of the knowledge which is power is not peculiar to the occult fraternities, for the medical profession does the same, and even the fiercest opponent of trade unionism would hardly care to maintain that anyone who has a mind to do so should be at liberty to buy a poison by the pound at the nearest grocer's. The knowledge guarded by the secret fraternities is too potent to be given out indiscriminately, and is guarded, not as a sordid trade secret, but as the power to dispense drugs is guarded, for the safety of the public. It may be asked, of course, that if occultism is so dangerous, had it not better be left alone? To which we reply that if a drug be sufficiently potent to act as a remedial agent, it will be sufficiently potent to upset the balance of metabolism or destroy the substance of tissues if given upon the wrong occasion or in the wrong quantity. And so with the cult science, because it is potent enough to raise the mind to higher consciousness, it is also potent enough, under wrong conditions, to destroy the mind. When we realize, for instance, the immense possibilities of hypnotism, even as practiced by the medical profession, and realize that this is but a leakage from the mysteries wherein a three-day cataleptic trance was part of the ritual of initiation, we can guess at the possibilities of occult knowledge in wrong hands. The power conferred by this knowledge is neither good nor bad in itself, any more than a lever is good or bad in itself, and it can be a servant of either regeneration or destruction. It depends entirely upon the motive with which it is handled. Can you, then, blame the guardians of this dangerous brightness if they use every precaution to ensure that it shall only find its way into clean and trustworthy hands? Be assured that the secrecy of the occult schools will never be relaxed till human nature is regenerated. The guardians of the secret wisdom are only too anxious to communicate it to those who are worthy to receive it, 
but suitable pupils are not very easily found. There are, on the other hand, earnest seekers after illumination who complain that the teachers do not make themselves sufficiently known, and therefore opportunity for advancement is denied. To these it may be replied that the finding of the teacher is one of the tests of the aspirant. There are plenty of indications offered by the propaganda organizations, and if the aspirant studies these carefully and draws his own conclusions, he will find the way. One hint may be given, however. The way lies inwards, and not outwards. We find the master on the inner planes before we are assigned to a teacher on the outer plane, and if we aspire with a resolute determination that never counts the cost, and on the material plane leave no stone unturned, importuning all those who have anything to give, ruthlessly discarding that which is found to be worthless, we shall work our way to our goal by the only path that leads there, learning as we go. It is useless to complain of the lack of signposts. The signposts are there for those who can read. It must not be forgotten, however, that although the persecution of the occultist in the present day does not take the form of the halter and faggot, it can make itself felt in subtler ways, and therefore occult fraternities have very strict obligations concerning secrecy as to their membership and places of meeting. If a man cares to announce himself as a student of the secret science, he has a right to do so, but he has also not only a right, but for certain work a necessity for secrecy. Antagonistic thought directed towards an occult operation may prevent its achievement, and therefore the situation of the temple and the names of the brethren must always be kept secret. There is one true charge, however, which can be laid at the door of the guardians of the secret wisdom. Have they made sufficient provision for the preaching in the marketplace, for the training in the outer court of the temple? Why was it that the Eastern tradition had to be brought to Europe? The soul that has once been initiated into an occult tradition finds its way back to its old school readily enough when it has reached spiritual maturity in each incarnation. To such, the secrecy of the fraternities presents no barrier. It has the entry and passes within the veil without obstruction. But the case is far otherwise for the soul that, having learnt all that evolution can teach it, is desirous of setting foot on the path for the first time. Such a one wastes much time and effort from lack of the necessary knowledge, and may well say to the guardians of the mysteries, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Eastern tradition has its outpost in the Theosophical Society. Has the Western tradition an equivalent? Do not let it be forgotten that traditions are racial, what that great initiate, Rudolf Steiner, did for the German-speaking races, someone must do for those who use a Latin root language or the Anglo-Saxon tongue. It may be argued that Madame Blavatsky did this, but to advance such an argument is to show ignorance of the fundamentals of occultism. I would be the last to belittle the work of that great pioneer and brave servant of the masters, but the fact remains that she brought no more than the kindling for the fire of the West, and until the coals of our native occultism catch, the fire cannot be said to be a light. Many times in the history of Western races has the light of occult science been stamped out on the physical plane, and as often has it been rekindled by a spark from an eastern altar. Whether from that of the Druzes of Lebanon or the Mahatmas of the Himalayas is immaterial, for there is but one light in the highest, and fire is of the same nature everywhere, be it of coals or of the spirit, what are our Western adepts doing to feed the sheep of their master, now that a hunger for the bread of wisdom has been awakened?